We open with Lister seeing something on the monitor. It's your kebab, sir, as requested. Over. Oh my god, how would you even eat that? I guess a better question is how could you eat it safely? At least he put the fire out? I love how he doesn't clean up after himself, and then he dumps it face down back onto the console. We have health and safety protocols for a reason, to safeguard the crew. The original crew, they all got wiped out, remember? This is an odd conversation because there is still a crew, as in our four main characters, just not the original crew. When you didn't fix that drive plate properly and that radiation leak fried them to a crisp. Exactly. Which is why the whole health and safety protocol procedure has been updated. Which Rimmer could have pointed out if he wasn't so dense. Because ultimately, who was truly to blame for that accident? The man or the system? The man. A system that allowed a technician to repair a drive plate without adequate training or know-how. He's actually not wrong. As Crichton pointed out in Justice, the blame ultimately falls on whoever put Rimmer in charge of that job in the first place. So what you're saying is you learn valuable safety lessons from wiping out the crew, and as a result, since making this ship a, a much safer working environment for the crew you wiped out. Also, they seem to have forgotten that the original crew did get resurrected in Season 8 and are still out there, as far as we know. To be fair, though, I try to forget about Season 8, too. It is still a funny conversation, though, if you don't think about it too much. In any case, now Lister has to fill out an accident report form. You'll have to submit it to the Accident Report Assessment Unit, care of the Health and Safety Executive. And who the schmeg would that be? Me. Yeah, that's gonna happen. It's 20 pages. I'll send you on the other sections later. Meanwhile, Kat's been hunting a space weevil. You'd think it'd be easy to find. Those things are huge. But Crichton has been running tests on crystals he's extracted from the quantum rod they got from Trojan. Interesting how that episode keeps coming up. Seems to be a curious power of synchronicity. It turns out that Cat had a dream earlier about Crichton doing something like that. What a weird coincidence! Hey, we both said that at the same time! And that! Yeah, this is gonna get old. Probably just coincidence! <laughs> Anyway, Crichton thinks he knows how to fix it. You think that cute thing made us speak at the same time? I doubt it, sir. Probably, Probably just coincidence. <laughs> but apparently it didn't work. There was a fascinating book on the subject by a scientist called Arthur Kirstler. Yeah, and that turns out to be the book the cat was using to hunt the space weevil. Anyway, the theory is that coincidences are most likely to happen when people are emotional, somehow heightening unconscious abilities. Only temporarily, sir. Space weevil! Crichton goes to tell Lister about it, but he's away, checking out a moon with life on it that he discovered while eating his kebab earlier. Now Lister needs to be let back in because he doesn't have his key. I don't know why, but I love that he's using that signal. We had a life sign confirmation from one of the scouters. I took Starbuck to check it out. The life signs turned out to belong to a new kind of gelf. The cool begs. Biologically engineered garbage gobblers created on Earth to eat refuse. I want to see if they'd help them find Kachansky. They've not seen her. Just spent the whole evening drinking whiskey and playing poker. Anyway, Lister is beating around the bush about it, but Crichton figures out what happened. You lost Starbuck in a card game? Oh, you've spoiled the end now! But there is some good news. I lost Rimmer too. Speaking of which, Crichton was about to deliver more report forms for Lister. Oh, cheers, Crichton! Night! Say goodbye to the report forms. Literally. Sometime later, it's been a while since we learned about something Crichton can do with an inappropriate body part. The right nipple nut was used to uh, regulate body temperature, while the left nipple nut was used mainly to uh, pick up shortwave radio transmissions. Just drying the cut sir. Using my heat outlet. Anyway, Rimmer asks about the report forms, and Crichton lets it slip that they ended up on the wrong side of the airlock. Another accident. That means he's gonna have to fill out two sets of accident report forms. Yeah, he kind of threw Lister under the bus there. Was an airlock accident risk assessment form completed before he opened the airlock? That may have been overlooked, sir. Well, that's another set of forms he's gonna have to fill in. Okay, I just want you to notice that Rimmer sets down this box of files and then walks off and leaves it there. So Rimmer goes to talk to Lister about what he did regarding the accident report forms. I have to say I'm disappointed, but not the least bit surprised. And of course Lister thinks Rimmer is talking about the card game. Look, let me say right off that I'm truly sorry, I really am. Lister is surprised at how well Rimmer is taking this, and Rimmer is happy that Lister is taking things so seriously. Listy, I have to say, I think you've finally become the vending machine third technician of my dreams. It's cute. What's this? The accident report forms. I haven't got time to waste twatting about with that. Now it comes out. Uh, Mr. Lister gambled you in a poker game, sir, and I'm afraid to report 
He lost you. You lost me in a poker game? Like I'm some kind of thing to be lost in a poker game? Rimmer thinks they can just cut their losses with Starbug and just get out of there. But there's one problem with that. Now that's a groin exploder, sir. If I don't make good on me debt, and this thing is gonna propel my love spuds to the far reaches of deep space. Man, those bags don't fuck around. It's rigged to blow if I tamper with it. I have to say, I'm taking no pleasure from this. No, wait, in fact, that's completely wrong. I'm taking immense pleasure from this. Crichton points out that if Lister dies, Rimmer will get shut off, since his main function is to keep Lister company. You're both sort of connected, like we are. What a coincidence! In any case, Crichton figures out that the Beggs aren't smart enough to come up with this device, so they must have gotten it somewhere else. So they visit the Beggs and try to make out like Rimmer isn't worth winning. I mean, they could have figured that out after spending five minutes with him. Yes, it is, but as you can see, he's old and rattled and fit for nothing. Anyway, Lister tries to trick them into thinking that this spoon is really valuable. No object hath such power. But the Beggs aren't that stupid and wonder why they don't want it if it's so powerful. Well, we just don't really use it much anymore. Also, the beg leader speaks English. If it pleases, maybe we will play cards again, and perhaps you will win back your hologram and your ship of green. But if they lose, the begs are going to get Crichton and Cat as well. Rimmer thinks they should play another game because they have nothing to lose. Crichton doesn't think it's a good idea, but Lister insists that the Beggs will lose this time, and he words it in a very convenient way. If anyone's gonna choke, they'll choke. <laughs> so they literally choke. What's he saying, Crichton? <laughs> He's speaking choking to death, sir. It's very hard to translate if you're not being strangled. <laughs> And Lister doesn't know how to get the device off. Later, Crichton tells him about the quantum synchronicity that he and Cat have been experiencing. He also thinks that they can use this to their advantage. So they turn on a TV and whatever is playing seems to be in sync with them as well. He's got to get to the station. It's his only chance. Maybe some space station. His fate is written in the stars. Well, there are stars on the cover of that book from earlier, and also dominoes showing numbers. Those sound like space coordinates. That's getting really annoying. It is. Anyway, ERA, the brand name on Lister's Grinnell Exploder, is the name of a space station and those coordinates might lead to it. So Crichton explains what ERA is. It's the Erroneous Reasoning Research Academy, sir, or ERA for short. And the ideas behind it. Most of the great scientific breakthroughs come when two theories previously dismissed as wrong are combined to make a right. Two wrongs make a right, that's cute. But they specialized in wrongness, sir. There were a lot of referees, TV critics, weathermen. Did it work? No, the man behind the idea was so depressed he attempted suicide. Naturally, he failed, and he went on to live into his 90s. Those are some pretty impressive levels of wrongness. In any case, once they get there, they find out that there's another life form in stasis. Top floor. Anyway, the way the elevator works is basically backwards. I'll press down. Now we're going up! But Rimmer likes it. I like this place. I'm very comfortable here. It feels like home. Figures. The stasis units are inside a locked vault, and Lister's groinal exploder is already starting to work. Can you just make it quick, because this is getting hotter. We're getting baked potatoes. <laughs> Sounds like it's getting ready to blow. Interesting choice of words. So they switch Rimmer to soft light mode so we can go through the wall. This might seem nitpicky, but a couple things bother me. One, I really wish the costume department had made a red version of Rimmer's uniform, like he obviously had in season six. It's pretty obvious that they just recolored it digitally, and it just doesn't look right. It's too purple, if nothing else. And two, I don't know why the surface warps around him since he's a holographic projection. I get wanting to make it look better than earlier in the show, but his just kind of cutting through a surface is really how it should look. According to the readouts, Female, age 31. Kachansky's female. And Lister being Lister, he's convinced that it's Kachansky. Ah, oh, it won't be air. It'll be someone else. Don't even think for one second that I think that it's air, because I know it isn't. I know it. Say it is. Do you think it might be? Anyway, meet Professor Edgington, head of the Era Institute and inventor of a groinal exploder. Yeah, of course it wasn't going to be Kachansky. <laughs> well, it's definitely not Kachansky. She went for me groin. 
So back on Red Dwarf, they're talking about how Dr. Edgington was trying to perfect evolution, testing it on herself, and naturally it caused her to de-evolve. Also, I love how her notes include a diagram of a banana. Anyway, Crichton has the machine she used, so he should be able to reverse engineer it to change her back. If we can evolve her back to her human form, she may be able to help us. <laughs> and it worked. So, here's Dr. Edgington. Please call me Irene, or Professor E. No points for guessing that she would be a stereotypical ditzy blonde. Mr. Rimmer. I've always been attracted to the brave, silent types. I mean, that's pretty much all you need to know about her right there. Despite my snark, I do like her. She's kind of an adorable little dingbat. Yeah, can you, um, help me get out of this? Also, her glasses are upside down. Five symbols. We have to turn them off in the correct order. What happens if we choose the wrong ones? Absolutely nothing. It's all perfectly safe. Oh, God. Basically, they have to do the exact opposite of whatever she suggests. Alpha, no beta, or delta. Delta or gamma. The only one Professor E hasn't mentioned is theta. So they do that, and it works for the first three. But once they get to the last one, they realize something. Her name's Irene, and her nickname is Professor E. Irony. Wouldn't it be ironic if a professor known for being wrong finally got something right? Make it stop. So they end up going with the one she suggested for the last one, and... Lister's love spuds will remain intact. Later on... Do you think it would be wrong for us to make love on our very first evening together? Incoming rimmerism. I've given this much thought. I don't think it would. In fact, I think it would be absolutely fine tickety boon peachy. Speaking of irony, here's the payoff for Rimmer leaving the box of report forms right next to the airlock. Damn, that's kind of brutal. You got a pen. And so ends Entangled. If forced to pick a least favorite episode of season 10, it'd probably be this one. It's not that it's bad, it's just maybe the least good of season 10, which is still pretty damn good overall. I think it just doesn't stand out like the first three did. Trojan had Howard Rimmer, which was amazing. Fathers and Sons had Lister getting drunk and arguing with himself via video, and that was hilarious. Not to mention Pre. Lemons had Jesus, twist notwithstanding, which was funny on its own, plus it had a bit of depth with how it took a critical look at Christianity. And after all that, this one doesn't really have anything big in it to make it comparable to those. So I guess it's a bit of a lull in the season, but again, I still think it's good. Technically, this episode is kind of a mess. A lot of scenes had to be filmed later without the audience, and they had to use a leg model for this scene because they hadn't cast Dr. E yet when they filmed it. I can't confirm this because I don't remember where I heard it and there's no mention of it in the making of documentary, so it may just be wrong, but I've heard that Kachansky actually was supposed to show up here, hence all the talk of her. I mean, if the Rod can bring in Rimmer's long-lost brother from three million years ago, why not Lister's love interest who disappeared only a few years ago? It definitely would have made sense within the context of this episode. But honestly, Lister going on and on about Kachansky is funnier that way. It feels like a running gag rather than foreshadowing, so it still works. Either way, whatever happened along the way, this episode comes together nicely, so we don't end up with a repeat of Pete. I do like how there was so much talk of coincidences and the way everything comes together with that is really clever, especially with how they manage to harness it and use it to their advantage, not to mention irony. Speaking of which, I got a kick out of Irene. She was cute as a button, and she and Rimmer made a cute couple for the all of about five seconds they spent together. SF Debris said that having her end up flushed out of an airlock for laughs was a little too mean-spirited. I can see that, but at the same time, I kind of get a kick out of how unexpected it is if you don't think about it too much. Just try not to think about that one scene in Guardians 2, or Event Horizon for that matter. This is one of the newer episodes that uses some ideas from the unmade episode Identity Within, namely Lister losing Starbug in a card game against a new race of Gelfs. They even sound like the Gelfs from Identity Within. Three swags and two more. Swirboy, friend. When I covered Identity Within, I got a surprising number of comments where people said, I don't know why they couldn't just make the episode now. Well, aside from the script already having been released to the public, this and Can of Worms is why. It's basically pointless to make it an episode at this time. Speaking of the Begs, their leader is actually played by the same guy who played the Gelf Bride in Emo Hawk. 
No Ainsley Harry at this time around, though. By the way, I feel like they've vastly improved on the costumes of these Gelfs compared to the Kinatawawi Gelfs. Also, for what it's worth, I thought the guy in the chimp costume was really convincing. Well, I guess that's about all I have to say about this one. The quote-unquote worst episode of season 10 is still pretty much a win in my book. Next up is Dear Dave. See you then. English boarding school, Dylan Garou. He went to an English boarding school. I uh, know, sir. He ate someone from an English boarding school. He forced them to teach them English, and then he munched them whole. 